Hi, I'm Dr. Evan Matthews. I'm here today to do part two of the lecture series on exercising in hot and cold environments. If you haven't already gotten and watched part one, go back and watch that now um, and then come back to this video. Part one was just kind of an overview of how our bodies deal with hot and cold, uh, hot and cold environments. This is going to be more specific to how our bodies deal with exercise in the heat and things about heat illness. Uh, back in part one, we talked about how the hypothalamus was the control center of the body. So let's talk a little bit about what happens when we get a heat load so, or heat stress, okay? So heat stress is going to increase our body temperature, so it's gonna give us a heat load, and that is going to be sensed by skin thermoreceptors and core thermoreceptors, which are just sensory neurons that are specifically designed to sense heat. And so it's gonna send that signal back to the hypothalamus where it's going to get integrated and the hypothalamus is gonna figure out are we too hot, are we too cold, are we just right? And it's going to adjust what it's doing based on that. And so primarily the adjustment is going to be through an increase in sympathetic nervous system activity um, to a specific area of the body depending on if it's too hot or too cold. If we are too hot, it's going to primarily be sending its sympathetic nervous system activity to the skin where it's gonna cause skin vasodilation, so an increase in the blood vessel diameter, allowing more blood to the skin, and it's going to increase the sweat rate, which is going to increase how much liquid we uh, allow out of our, our bodies onto the skin surface so that evaporation can take place, lowering body temperature back down. Looking at sweat rates, so on this graph here, we have exercise over time ending with 45 minutes of exercise. This is constant aerobic exercise at a, probably a vigorous intensity. Uh, and we have sweat rate on the y-axis here. And so you can see that in the cool environments, we sweat a lot less than what we do if we're exercising in a hot and humid environment. So if we're exercising on a hot day at a high intensity, um, we can lose easily as, uh, up to four to five liters of water in a single hour through sweat. And so uh, if you're losing that much water, uh, dehydration becomes a severe risk. And so dehydration can come with all kinds of downsides that we'll talk about more later, um, up to le uh, potentially even death. All right, so some other things that are gonna happen. So we're going to vasodilate the skin and the blood vessels in the skin in hot environments in order to promote heat loss. And this is gonna increase blood flow quite a bit compared to uh, exercise in cold environments or just temperate environments where it's comfortable. Um, and so in these hot environments, we're going to cause a lot of blood pulling in the skin. And this is when a lot of people get sort of a flushed look. They get that reddening, reddening to their skin. That's because they have a lot of blood in their skin that's just kind of sitting there helping to dissipate heat. And so with this, we're going to sweat as mentioned, that's going to decrease blood volume. And so as we're decreasing blood volume, the reason why it's decreasing blood volume is sweat is just filtered blood. So it's the plasma in the sweat, uh, the plasma in the blood that's turning into sweat and being expelled from the body in order to cool us down. If we're taking plasma out of the blood and allowing it to turn into sweat, that, again, that's gonna decrease our blood volume. So when we're hot and we're sweating and we have all this blood pooling in our skin, that's gonna decrease how much venous return we have, both because we're losing blood volume through sweat and because a lot of the blood is just pulling in the skin, just sitting in the skin and not getting back to the heart. So decreased venous return is going to cause decreased stroke volume, which is how much blood comes out of the heart with each heartbeat. And so if we have a decrease in stroke volume, that's gonna progressively decrease as we exercise more and more and more. That's going to require a slow increase in heart rate. So if you were to measure heart rate on uh, somebody exercising at a steady state over a very long period of time in a hot environment, you would see what we call cardiovascular drift. And this is again, just a slow progressive increase in heart rate as we sweat more and more and more. And this is caused by the slow decrease in stroke volume caused by the loss in blood volume. Oftentimes when we're trying to see um, how hot the environment feels, because keep in mind that the actual temperature of the, the air is only one component of this. The other part of this is humidity. So if we have, for instance, an 80 degree day with 80% humidity, that's going to feel more like an 89 degree day. So this is in Fahrenheit right now. And so looking at this uh, this uh, table here, we have the 
air temperature across the x-axis across the top. So across the y-axis here we have relative humidity, so that's the percentage of the um, saturation of the air, so how saturated the air is. So 100% means it's fully saturated, 40% means only 40% of what uh, the water the air can take is in the air. And so we can still get another 60% of water into the air. Um, at a 40% relative humidity. And so if you you look at this, I'll let you read the different numbers yourself, um, but as the humidity goes up, the level of sort of caution is going to increase. Also, as the temperature goes up, the level of caution is going to increase. And if you increase both of these, you are going to get yourself into a very extreme danger zone pretty quickly. So high heat, high humidity, is way more dangerous than just high humidity or just high heat by itself. And so together, the temperature and the humidity of the air is what we call the heat indexes, which is what we're seeing right here. And it's that sort of feels-like temperature that you oftentimes see reported on the weather channel and different um, weather stations. Uh, again, it's, it's what our body experiences rather than the actual air temperature. So why do we care about the heat index rather than just looking at air temperature? Again, heat index takes into consideration humidity. Humidity is how saturated the air is. If the air is really saturated, that means that um, it's less able to uh, ha allow the sweat on our bodies to evaporate and so that evaporation doesn't happen nearly as efficiently and so we don't evaporate as much heat away from our body and we don't transfer as much heat away from our body that way and so when uh, we're talking about exercise exercise primarily the way we reduce uh, the body's temperature during exercise is through sweat and through evaporation all right, so if you sweat and the, the water on your skin doesn't evaporate, so in this hot, humid environment, we're still going to sweat a lot, but the sweat isn't going to evaporate. It's going to drip off our skin or we're going to wipe it away. And when we do that, we don't allow it to evaporate. All right, so removing that liquid from our skin before it, it evaporates is going to greatly reduce the amount of heat loss we, we get from that sweat. All right, so dripping sweat off or wiping sweat off prevents the evaporation. Remember, the reason why sweat's so effective for uh, moving heat off of our body is because the liquid on the surface of our skin, that, li that sweat on the surface of our skin, is going to go from a liquid state to a gas state. It's going to float away, taking lots of energy with it. If it get doesn't get to transfer from liquid to gas, it means we're not going to lose nearly as much temperature, so body heat, from that. And so um, that is the main reason why we care so much about humidity because it greatly lowers the, the chance that we're going to evaporate the, the liquid, which is going to decrease how much heat transfer we can do. The heat index isn't the best method for evaluating what the temperature outside is going to feel like. The best method we have is something called a wet bulb globe temperature, which is going to incorporate everything that's in the heat index plus one more factor. So let's go ahead and talk about that right now. So this here is a diagram of essentially what a wet bulb globe temperature apparatus is doing. All right, so most of the time nowadays, you're not going to see something like this. You're going to see just a digital version of this that's kind of like a handheld device. Um, but this is essentially what it's based on. So we have a wet bulb here. So by bulb, I'm talking about a thermometer. And so this wet bulb has a little bit of um, tissue or something on it that's going to allow it to hold on to liquid. And so what we do is we, we take this water cup here we put it up onto that so it gets wet we pull the water cup away and so this bulb is uh, soaking wet and so as that liquid evaporates off the bulb you will see a drop in the temperature of the bulb because of evaporation so this wet bulb is essentially assessing the ability of um, our bodies or whatever object we, we're talking about to evaporate heat away and so if it's a hot humid day this bulb isn't going to respond quite as much to this because it's not going to allow it to evaporate as well. All right, so the next uh, bulb here or the next thermometer is the black globe bulb. All right, the black globe bulb is literally a thermometer placed into the center of a black globe. Usually nowadays it's going to be a plastic black globe. And so what we know about um, the color black is it absorbs radiant heat very, very well. And so what you would do is you put this outside, typically in the sun, and the sun's radiation would hit this black globe heat it up and heat up the, uh, the thermometer that's inside of it and so that's going to raise the temperature in this and it's going to assess the heat strain that the body is going to feel 
um, from solar radiation. And so if you think about this, it's similar to if you go into a, a car that's been closed on a hot day, the inside of that car is really, really hot, and that's because it's trapped a lot of the sun's radiant heat. Same idea here, this black globe is gonna trap a lot of the sun's radiant heat and raise up the temperature inside of this, again, assessing uh, radiation coming from the sun. And then the last part of this is simply the dry bulb, which is exactly a normal thermometer. And so all it does is look at air temperature and it is exposed to um, uh, the wind typically, so you're doing this outside. And so if there's any convective heat loss or gain through the wind, it's going to be picked up by this. So we have the wet bulb assessing our ability to evaporate heat away. We have the black globe bulb, which is assessing the um, radiant heat that the sun would give to our bodies. And then we have the dry bulb here, which is assessing air temperature as well as convective uh, heat gain and loss through not only the air temperature, but the wind uh, that might be blowing across the bulb. And so if you take these three uh, temperatures and you put them into the wet bulb globe temperature um, equation, so the dry bulb here, the temperature is being uh, multiplied by 0.1, the wet bulb is being multiplied by, by 0.7, while the black globe is being multiplied by 0.2. So what this means is 10% of the temperature that the wet bulb globe temperature is going to calculate is coming from the dry bulb. 20% uh, of the temperature is going to come from the globe, the black globe temperature, and 70% of the temperature is going to be assessed through the wet bulb. So the wet bulb is clearly the most important. Um, again, that's the one that it takes into consideration humidity and the ability to evaporate heat away. So looking at some thresholds for the wet bulb globe temperature and essentially how risky it is. So is it too cold outside or too hot outside? Uh, I'll let you go ahead and pause this video and read through this yourself. Um, I'm only gonna mention now the, uh, the sort of upper end of the extremes. So if the wet bulb globe temperature goes above 27.8 degrees Celsius or 82 degrees Fahrenheit, this uh, puts your athletes or yourself at extreme risk if you're exercising in this environment. And so the risk of hyperthermia, which is just our body temperature being too high, becomes really, really high. Um, and uh, you're, you're putting people at a much too great of risk in order to allow them to exercise. And so you really should cancel or postpone the event or the practice or whatever it is that's going on. Um, or you can alternatively move it indoors to, into an, an uh, air-conditioned space in order to prevent some sort of heat illness. And so when I talk about heat illness, I'm talking about things like heat stroke, um, uh, where people have uh, oftentimes, pretty much every summer around August, September, you hear about people who die out on practice fields. Usually it's football players because of all the pads they wear, plus the fact that they tend to be larger people with bigger bodies, producing a lot of heat and holding a lot of heat. Um, but anyways, uh, people exercising in this area of the wet bulb globe temperature spectrum are much more likely to experience that than people at these lower body temperature or at these lower wet bulb globe temperatures. You look at this, this is different types of weather fatalities um, from 2017, as well as a 10 year average and a 30 year average. I'm gonna focus mostly on the 30 year average. Um, it's the one that has the most data, so it's probably the most clear um, and less susceptible to outliers. Um, but the 30 year average, this yellow bar, the largest uh, cause of weather related fatalities um, is going to be coming from heat. So um, this is uh, from the United States. And so again, heat is the primary cause of weather fatalities, uh, more than hurricanes, tornadoes, more than lightning, um, more than flooding, more than winter and cold, wind, more than rip currents, more than all of those, heat is the one that's going to cause the majority of the uh, the deaths in the United States um, from the weather. And so if you want a little more information on this, you can scan this QR code to go to the website where I found this, or you can type in this link here and go directly to the website uh, that way as well. Um, but the point of this is that he is an extremely dangerous thing and we do need to treat it seriously. So uh, now we know that heat's very dangerous and a very important thing to keep in mind when deciding whether to cancel tr practice or move it indoors or to cancel an athletic event um, or whatever it is that you're working with um, when it comes to exercise. Um, the 
reasons why it's so important is because of the potential for heat illness. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about heat illnesses now. Um, this first slide is going to be on heat cramps, which is sort of the low end of heat illness, the least serious of all of them. And so um, with cramps, we're going to have these painful contractions or um, painful spasms of the muscles. Um, typically, it's of the abdomen or the legs, and it's going to cause a lot of pain, but it's not usually going to cause any long-term damage. Um, so when somebody is experiencing heat cramps, they're likely to also be experiencing extreme thirst, um, heavy sweating, all the signs that they are exercising or just out in some sort of very hot environment. The cause of these heat cramps is going to be losses of sodium. So uh, the sodium electrolytes in our blood and in our, our cells of our body caused from dehydration. So as we sweat, we lose a lot of electrolytes, sodium being one of those electrolytes, and that's going to eventually um, cause uh, some sort of imbalance that can lead to uh, involuntary painful muscles cramps. All right. And so it's going to be more likely to happen in people who are heavy sweaters. So can you get two people out on a hot day? One person's barely sweating, another person's sweating a lot. The person who sweats a lot is more likely to experience these heat cramps because they're just, they're losing more liquid and more sodium that way. Um, and so preventing this is pretty simple. Just um, allow them to drink lots of water and make sure they're consuming sodium in some way, whether that's through a sports drink that has sodium in it or through just eating food that has sodium in it um, and as long as they're doing that on a regular basis and they're not exercising for too long without some sort of water break or a break where they're getting electrolytes in um, then most likely people are going to be able to prevent heat cramps Moving to the next heat illness, so we're going progressively more dangerous with the heat illnesses here. So now we're going to talk about heat exhaustion, which again is worse than heat cramps, but not as bad as heat stroke, which is what we're going to talk about next. Um, but heat exhaustion, typically you're going to feel fatigued, which is where the, the word heat exhaustion comes from. But you can also get some headaches, some vo uh, nausea and vomiting, um, some chills, some goosebumps, um, maybe pale sort of um, clammy type skin. So all these are signs that are thermal regulatory mechanisms are becoming overwhelmed. They're still functioning, but they're becoming overwhelmed. Um, and so think about this as the hypothalamus is becoming overwhelmed. It's not quite capable of dealing with all these things that are happening. And so typically, if you don't stop the exercise, get them into a cool environment, cool them off uh, quickly, heat exhaustion can quickly um, turn into heat stroke, which is much more dangerous. So part of the reason why we see some of these things is with with heat exhaustion, um, you've already dehydrated the body typically from uh, a lot of sweat. And so you have this simultaneous uh, pool of blood flow away from the core of the body while also losing lots of blood volume through sweat. And so our bodies aren't quite able to do everything it needs to do. And if we continue and we don't address things before it gets to this point, and now keep in mind, while I'm showing this as a continuum here, where heat cramps happen first, then heat exhaustion happens, and then heat heat stroke happens. This isn't always the way it happens. Sometimes people will experience this as a continuum, but sometimes people will skip the first two and go right to heat stroke, or they'll f skip the first one and go to heat exhaustion, then heat stroke. Point is, you can't expect to see this order of events happening every single time, so you have to be looking out for these signs of heat exhaustion and signs of heat stroke all the time. You can't just wait to see if these things happen first. So it's not like if they're not cramping, they're never going to experience heat stroke. They might pass the cramping and go straight to heat stroke. And so the issue with that is heat stroke is very dangerous. It's a life-threatening condition. This is what people who die from um, the heat or die from exercise in the heat, this is what they die from. They die from heat stroke. And so with this, we have a failure of our thermoregulatory mechanism. So the hypothalamus is beyond overwhelmed at this point. It's essentially given up. It's now malfunctioning. It's not uh, doing what it's supposed to do. And so people are going to experience dizziness, maybe fainting. Um, they might lose consciousness. Um, they uh, are going to have now a lack of Sweat, their skin is going to feel hot, it might get red. And so again, you want to sweat when you're very, very hot because it's how we dissipate heat. But our hypothalamus, our thermoregulatory mechanisms are misfunctioning at this point. And so we have a lack of sweat, which only makes things worse. Um, people oftentimes will get sort of confusion. They, um, they don't speak well. They don't understand what's happening around them. And again, that's because their brain is essentially shutting down. 
Typically, when somebody is experiencing heat stroke, that means that their body temperature is greater than 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, doesn't always have to be though. Um, everybody has a different threshold where they start experiencing these symptoms and when they start going into heat stroke. But again, typically it's around 40 degrees Celsius. So with heat stroke, uh, comas can happen, uh, organ failures can happen. And then again, of course, uh, the worst possible outcome would be death. And people do die from this every year in the United States, um, as mentioned uh, a couple slides back. And so heat stroke is very, very, very dangerous and you need to to address it immediately if you think it's happening. And so the ways you address it would be to uh, obviously call 911, uh, activate the emergency action uh, plan that you, you should have in place, um, get some sort of medical personnel on their way there, and in the meantime, lower their body temperature down as quickly as you can, get them out of the heat, get them into an air conditioned environment, get them into some sort of um, cold shower, an ice bath, something like that in order to lower that body temperature quickly. The longer their body temperature is elevated, the more damage their body is going to experience and the more likely they are to have organ failure and death. So let's quickly go over the tips on how to address heat illnesses when they happen. Now this isn't an all-inclusive list, this is just sort of the big highlights, um, but you really do need to lower body temperature as quickly as possible with all the different heat illness types. And so some sort of cold water immersion, whether that's a, a cold bath, an ice bath, a cold shower, um, maybe cold towels that are wrapped around the individual and then when they get hot, you take them away and you get them cold again and you bring them back. Um, something to lower the body temperature needs to take place. Um, if the person is awake and uh, capable of drinking fluids, then they should also be drinking fluids. Um, if the individual is in a hot environment still, you really need to get them out of that hot environment. So the quicker you can get them away from the source of heat, which is the environment, and into some sort of cold environments like an ice bath, an ice bath or a cold shower, the better the person is going to be. Um, you also need to expose as much of the skin as possible because remember we're going to dissipate heat through the skin so if the person's covered in clothes um, that clothing is going to hold a lot of heat in so remove as much clothing as you can um, if the person's experiencing heat cramps which is the again the lowest level of heat illness you can simply stretch and massage the cramped muscles and that will help to dissipate the the cramp and lower the pain the, uh, that the individual's in but you still need to do these other things that are going to lower the body temperature. If the individual is in heat stroke or you suspect they might be in heat stroke or approaching heat stroke, so you need to activate an emergency medical system in order to get them medical attention, which in the United States typically we just call 911. So to get more information on this, you can go to the National Weather Service's webpage on heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. And here's the link. Um, I also have the QR code here that you can scan to go to that webpage. Those are all the tips on how to deal with with some sort of heat illness after it happens, ideally you prevent it from happening in the first place. So some guidelines for exercise in, in hot environments. So um, the first one here is probably the most obvious, exercise in the coolest part of the day. So if you know it's gonna be a hot day, um, exercise in the morning, wait until uh, after the sun's gone down, maybe exercise then um, in order to decrease the amount of heat load you're getting from the environment. Um, if the wet bulb globe temperature goes above 27.8 degrees Celsius or 82 degrees Fahrenheit, um, this is something we already mentioned, but if it goes above that, you really should alter, cancel, move practice indoors to an air conditioned environment, something. You can't have um, your athletes or yourself or your clients exercising outside in this kind of heat. It's not safe. Um, so you need to lower the exercise intensity, decrease the duration that they're exercising for a given period of time without breaks, expose as much skin as possible to maximize evaporation as a source for heat transfer, um, take again uh, frequent breaks and allow um, some sort of a removal of equipment if they're wearing something like football pads, uh, removal of jerseys, whatever it is that might be holding heat in. Um, get some sort of air circulating in the area where they take breaks so have fans maybe those 
misting fans that you oftentimes see would, would be great. Um, get them in shade, so you need to make sure they're not just standing in the sun during their, their cooling break. They need to actually be out of the heat during this period of time. And you also need to avoid dehydration, which is going to make all this uh, much worse and much more likely to happen. So during these breaks, you need to make sure that your athletes, your clients, yourself are drinking lots and lots of water. Um, there is a point where it's too much, but generally speaking, most people don't hit that. Keep in mind, even if it's just at a selfish standpoint here, that you don't wanna decrease yours or your, your clients or your athletes' exercise performance, our exercise performance drops significantly with a, around a 2% or so, 1% to 2% um, uh, dehydration, which is not that much dehydration. So if you're not allowing um, your athletes or yourself to um, hydrate as you exercise, your performance is going to drop. So if for no other reason um, other than that sort of shallow reason, you should make sure that you are preventing um, yourself from becoming dehydrated. But Obviously, the more important reason is to prevent some sort of heat illness. Talking about uh, staying hydrated, look at let's look at this graph together here. So we have exercise time. So this is a continuous aerobic type exercise um, in a hot environment, and we have rectal temperature here on the y-axis. Um, remember that is our temperature, our, our core temperature. If you don't replace fluids um, as people sweat and lose liquids, you're going to see a much greater rise in core temperature than if you. Do replace fluids and allow people to drink water and so water replacement and water consumption during ex exercise especially in hot environments is extremely important for preventing a, a potentially dangerous increase in body temperature and so uh, the recommendations for this would be 400 to 800 milliliters of uh, fluid three hours prior to exercise so you're making sure the person's hydrated before starting exercise maybe even hyper hydrating them so that um, they have a little bit more of a cushion to sweat that water out um, then consume 150 to 300 milliliters of water every 15 to 20 minutes during the exercise and of course you're going to have to adjust this volume depending on the individual depending on um, how much they sweat depending on the heat in the environment to ensure that people will rehydrate after exercise you really should uh, weigh them before exercise weigh them typically you would do this nude so you would um, have them undress you'd have them weigh themselves and then at the end of exercise they would undress dry themselves off off with, so there's no liquid on, the, on their skin and then weigh themselves again and for every kilogram of uh, weight loss it's one liter of fluid replacement that you need to do so if you lose approximately 2.2 pounds you need to drink one liter of water in order to gain back the water you lost during that exercise bout another thing that you can do is monitor the urine color and this is probably the one people are more likely to do and what you're aiming for is sort of a light yellow all right, you don't necessarily need it to be clear, that's probably overhydrated, but you don't want it to be a dark yellow. You certainly don't want it to be a red or a brown color. That's a sign that there might be some issues and they probably should see, um, see some sort of medical professional. Um, there's likely blood in their urine, that's, that's an issue. And besides just replenishing water, um, there are other things that we're using up with exercise. So we're blowing through our uh, glucose and our glycogen stores, and we're also losing a lot of electrolytes. So so sports drinks are, are really better than water if someone's exercising for greater than an hour. If they're exercising less than an hour, you probably don't need sports drinks. Just have the people drinking water and they can eat a normal meal afterwards and they'll be just fine. But if you're exercising more than an hour, um, you really do need to have some sort of an electrolyte beverage um, that is going to have some carbohydrates in it to replenish, again, the water, the electrolytes, and also the carbs so that they can keep exercising at a high intensity. So I just mentioned exercising and how if we don't replenish uh, water and electrolytes and carbohydrates and how it's going to decrease performance. But let's So let's talk about for a moment why exercise performance drops when we exercise in hot environments. All right, so we're going to have accelerated glycogen metabolism so this means we're going to blow through our glucose stores a lot faster which is bad for long-term performance but it also means we're going to increase
increase the amount of lactic acid that's produced. And if we produce lactic acid, that's going to come with uh, negative sensations, burning, fatigue, uh, muscle, uh, uh, sort of crampy-ish type sensations. You know, we're going to lose the ability to contract our muscles appropriately if we're producing lots of lactic acid. We're also going to produce a lot of free radicals. So free radicals are molecules that um, are missing an electron in their outermost orbital. Um, and so what this does is these molecules go around and they try to they try to fill their electron um, uh, circles and when they do that they're going to take electrons from other molecules and they're going to damage those molecules so they don't function appropriately and so we're talking about something at a very molecular basis here um, but if a free radical is taking electrons away from um, some sort of enzyme uh, molecule or whatever else, it's going to either decrease or stop the function of that molecule. And so that can cause um, symptoms of fatigue and decreased performance. And it's also going to decrease the muscle's contractile ability um, because it's going to damage the muscle's proteins. And so when I'm talking about free radicals, this is sort of the opposite of an antioxidant. So oftentimes when people talk about how antioxidants are so good, that's because they help to quench free radicals. They they donate an electron to free radicals. Beyond that, that's kind of a complicated complicated topic that we're not going to go into. Antioxidants aren't always good, uh, but they often are. But we're not going to get into that here. All right, so. We also have reduced blood flow to the um, uh, to the body because we're going to be sending so much blood flow to the skin, and we're going to also sweat out a lot of liquid, which is coming from the blood. And so during high intensity exercise, we need this blood flow, and so we're going to have less of it, and that's going to decrease our exercise performance because we're going to have less oxygen getting around the body and less nutrients getting around the body as well. If the brain's temperature goes up too much, you're also going to get a decreased neuromuscular drain. Drive. And so this is the signal from the brain to the muscles causing the muscle to contract. So this is something called central fatigue. So the central nervous system is going to stop firing as it normally would, which is going to decrease the number of motor units that are recruited in the muscle decreasing the performance of that muscle and obviously decreasing exercise performance then. So obviously all of these things I just mentioned are downsides to exercising the heat, but we usually do have to exercise the heat at some point in time. Um, maybe you have a um, sports season that you are, uh, that's in the, you know, in the spring, so coming into the hot environment, or um, maybe you're going to be traveling from wherever you live that's in a temperate environment to a more hot environment. So that, you know, let's say you're a high elite level athlete in the United States and you have to go down um, to say Mexico City, which is uh, closer to the equator um, for some major sporting event. And it's going to be a lot hotter there. What you, you're going to want to do is you're going to want to acclimate your body to the heat. All right, so acclimation means to essentially get your body used to the heat so it handles it better. So heat acclimation requires several days to weeks. Um, and what you really need to do is you need to elevate the core temperature in controlled manners um, over a period of days to weeks in order to cause your body to alter itself in order to handle that heat better in the future. And so some uh, common models for heat acclimation training would be to exercise um, 10 to 14 days in hot environments and to either exercise at a low intensity for a long duration, so under 50% of VO2 max for 60 minutes to 100 minutes per day, or exercise at a more moderate intensity for shorter durations, so 75% of VO2 max, 30 to 35 minutes per day. And either one of these is going to allow your body to experience some heat load, and that heat load is gonna force your body to adapt, hopefully in a safe way so that you um, become heat acclimated and you don't experience the negative effects of heat. So what happens after our bodies acclimate to the heat? We're gonna have about a 10 to 12% increase in plasma volume. All right, so remember that when we exercise in heat, we sweat out a lot of plasma volume as, as sweat and so having more plasma volume is going to be beneficial it's also going to so it's going to increase blood volume uh, increasing the sweating capacity that i just mentioned it's also going to increase stroke volume because you're going to have more blood volume that can get more blood back to the heart and if there's more blood getting back to the heart you can pump more blood out per heartbeat and so if stroke volume is higher heart rate can actually be lower so if we look over here at this diagram we have exercise time on the x-axis, we have heart rate on the y-axis, and so we have the version of yourself that's not acclimated as the red line, 
and the version of yourself that is acclimated to heat as the blue line. So you can see that um, the heart rate of the acclimated version of you is lower than the heart rate of the non-acclimated version of you. And this is going to be something that is true at all submaximal levels of exercise. Um, once you get to max, your heart rate is going to be maxed out anyways, but at submaximal exercise intensities, which is typically where we are during the majority of like an athletic event, Again, the acclimated version of you is going to be at a lower heart rate, which is good. It means you have more capacity to increase heart rate so you can exercise at a higher intensity. Following heat acclimation, you're also going to sweat earlier and sweat uh, larger volumes. And so if you're sweating larger volumes, this turns into a better um, regulation of core body temperatures. So if you look down at this graph here on the x-axis, again, we have exercise time and on the y-axis, now we have core body temperature. And so you can see the non-acclimated version of you, um, core temperature goes up a lot more. The acclimated version of you, core temperature stays much, much lower, um, primarily because you're able to sweat a lot more and continue to dissipate heat to the environment at a higher rate because of this higher and earlier sweating rates. Um, so this is all beneficial in order to maintain your body temperature. Um, so some other things that are going to happen is your body is going to increase its uh, sensitivity to aldosterone. Aldosterone is the hormone um, that is going to prevent your body from losing sodium and chloride. So our sweat is going to become more dilute and we're not going to sweat out as much sodium and chloride, which is a good thing because it's going to reduce the risk of having some sort of electrolyte imbalance or disturbance. Um, so things like heat cramps are going to be much less likely. We're also going to, um, after heat acclimation, produce more heat shock proteins. Heat shock proteins are these proteins inside the cells of our body that will go around and essentially refold proteins that have come out of their appropriate shape. Right, so the shape of a protein is very important because if it's not in the right shape, it's not going to function the way it's supposed to. So if you think about the, that inside of a cell, so you have this protein that does whatever, maybe it's a contractile protein, maybe it's something else, doesn't matter. Um, if it becomes too hot, it's going to lose its shape, it's going to sort of unfold, it's going to straighten out. And this is essentially what happens if you cook a piece of meat that you're going to eat. So if you think about like a steak, all right, so when you take a steak and you um, and it's raw, you can kind of fold it and flip it and do whatever you want to it. It's very loose. Once you cook that steak, it's going to get progressively more and more firm as it cooks. And what that is, it's the proteins in that steak changing their shape and sort of locking up and preventing it from being its normal loose version of itself that would have been its functional version of itself. And so the same thing is going to happen in our body. And if we're experiencing a lot of heat, so a heat load, especially exercise in the heat, um, a lot of our proteins are going to lose their shape and these heat shock proteins are specialized proteins that are going to go and be activated in these situations and refill the other proteins so that they will continue to do their job and continue, continue to work. Um, so these heat shock proteins again are going to increase um, after heat acclimation. And so all of these things um, that I just described that are going to change with heat acclimation are going to result in a reduced perceived exertion. So uh, in other words, you're going to feel like you're not working quite as hard as what you would have felt like if you were to have not been heat acclimated. So let's say you're running on a treadmill at 10 miles per hour after um, heat acclimation versus before, you're not going to feel like it's quite as difficult afterwards. So let's go ahead and stop here. This will be the end of part two of the series of lectures on exercising in hot and cold environments. Again, part one was all an overview of how our bodies deal with heat and cold. Um, part two is all about uh, specifically exercising in the hot environments. Part three is going to be about exercising in cold environments. So please come back and watch that. If you have any questions, you can put those in the comment section below. Otherwise, thanks for watching this video.